Um, where did I leave off? I'm going to give myself a mark so I can cut this down. So one way of making the argument for a kind of small L nationalism, uh, sorry, one way of making the argument for a kind of small N nationalism would be to go via one of these kinds of arguments, to either say that um, the state is like a voluntary obligation, uh, a voluntary association. I have special obligations to Americans because I've made some sort of mm, maybe implicit kind of promise to, to be part of America. Remember, there are all sorts of issues that arise with the question of when you've contracted for this. Um, but, you know, I've promised to be an American in a way that I have not promised to be French. And as a result, I have special obligations to America and Americans that I don't have to France and the French. Or to say that I am entangled in relationships with Americans in a way that I'm not entangled in relationships with typical French people. Uh, I participate in American politics. I drive on American roads. I, you know, my life impacts on the American people around me. It does not impact on the French in that way. Um, therefore, I have special obligations to ensure that I that uh, I engage in sort of fair dealing with Americans that I don't with the French. Now, both of these kinds of defenses come in for pretty obvious sorts of attack. And it doesn't mean that they're, they're fatally flawed, but there are pretty obvious lines of attack. The first one just goes back to all the problems with implicit contracts. Uh, for most of us, myself included, there was no moment at which we made an explicit promise to be Americans. Uh, and so trying to model it on, trying to model uh, some kind of national particularist obligations on the model of promising runs into all the same problems that social contract theories in general run into. And then for the connections one, the obvious objection is at least now, the world is very globalized, right? Um, we had in class the discussion of the iPads, you know, um, I in fact do have all sorts of interactions with people outside of America. In a lot of ways, I might, I certainly, my, my life certainly impacts on the lives of a whole bunch of Chinese people that I've never met. And it might even impact on their lives in a much more direct and possibly more problematic way than it impacts on the lives of a lot of Americans around. So it's not obvious that this gets us what we want, especially it's not obvious that this gets us a real bright line. Uh, you know, especially on the interaction one, you might say, well, all right, I do actually interact more with Americans than with the Chinese, but it's going to be a kind of fuzzy matter of degree. It's not going to be this thing where my, my obligations really shift drastically at the border of the country. Okay, so a different line of attack is to say, well, uh, it's, it's sort of, um, Miller talks about this as the administrative solution. We're better situated to help co-nationals. And so, uh, you know, especially utilitarians are fond of this. They say, well, everyone's better off if we help the people near us. Um, this, again, runs into a couple of, uh, a couple of odd results that make it uh, not terribly attractive to everyone. As Miller points out, this does seem, you know, even if there was some weight to this, Right. Even if it turns out I know a bit better how to deal with Americans, how to help out Americans than I do how to help out Somalis. Um, other things might balance that, right? I might waste a lot of resources if I try to help out Somalis, but I got a lot more resources to waste than a lot of than most Somalis do. Um, you know, there's all there also might be again this sort of issue that it doesn't get us kind of the bright line at the moral line at the border that we want. Um, you know, there might be plenty, of, you know, what about Somali Americans, right? There might be plenty of Somali Americans who know at least as well how to help out Somalis to help out Americans. Um, you know, I grew up in the Northeast. Northeastern culture is not that much different from Canadian culture. Let me tell you, the, the culture of upstate New York is a lot closer to the culture of Quebec than it is to the culture of Texas. And yet, if we take a nationalist perspective, I might have more 
you know, it, we're saying that I should be more morally obligated to help out people in Texas than to help, people, help out people in Canada. So the we are better situated sort of thing also doesn't quite get us the bright line that we want. Now, before I put a line under this, both of these kinds of arguments, the um, especially the kind of we have interactions and we might be better situated to help, they might be more plausible as ways of supporting a kind of um, universalist saving of the appearances of particularism, right? To say, we have these intuitions that seem to be irreducibly particularist, but they're not. They're just universalism plus recognizing that we've got certain kinds of, of entanglements um, or proximities or knowledge. They're less promising as ways of trying to save some aspects of nationalism because they don't seem to line up with the national borders all that cleanly. So the last kind of challenge and the deeper challenge and one that would go to a big end nationalism is to say, look, uh, cosmopolitan and universalism rely on a very naive picture of what's valuable in life um, and a naive picture of moral psychology. And this, this is the communitarian challenge to liberalism in general, right? The, this is the, the challenge that says universalism, in particular liberalism, has this view of the human being that we are these like rational, freestanding creatures, and we come into and you know we choose our own lives and choose our own associations. And the communitarians are going to say, no, 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 no. That gets everything backwards. We become rational only in the context of a thick, deep community history, tradition, all that sort of stuff. Take that all, take that all away, and you don't have human beings. Um, and so you can't base your moral theory on individualism the way that liberalism wants to. That's the deepest challenge, and that's what we're going to spend a, a bunch of our time talking about today. All right, before we get to that, though, let's talk a little bit about liberal attempts to justify nationalism. And these actually, they straddle the line between a kind of instrumental view and a kind of big N nationalist view. Different liberals are going to disagree about, about whether this kind of argument establishes that there's something inherently important about the nation from a moral standpoint, or whether it is a, just a sophisticated kind of, um, you know, showing how you can you can be a nationalist of some kind, even though you're a universalist morally. All right, so what classifies them as liberal is we start out from the same basic liberal assumption, that the state is neutral about conceptions of the good life. The state takes no stand about whether, you know, what value system is true, what religion is true, um, what kind of lives are good, bad, or indifferent, um, what kind of lives people should live. The state doesn't take any, any stance about the inherent value of any of these things. But as Kimlicka points out, there's a difference between the state not taking a stance on the inherent value of things and the state not adopting policies on these sorts of issues for instrumental reasons. So the most obvious one is uh, common language. Now, this is actually contentious in the U.S., but, um, you know, so in the U.S., of course, we don't have an official language for the country. Most of the people who support making English an official language, of course, have a kind of value judgment involved. It's not quite clear that they think that English is the best language in some objective sense, but they at least think that English is in some way the most appropriate language for American culture. But you need not even go that far, right? Um, you could take seriously some of the instrumental arguments that are made about it, right? So it is administratively burdensome to uh, publish government materials in a variety of different languages, the way that we often do in the U.S., right? We do it to try to accommodate um, minority groups that don't necessarily, especially immigrant groups that don't necessarily speak English, um, but, you know, it costs money. Uh, and there certainly are some inefficiencies that come from not having everyone speak the same language. So on purely instrumental grounds, you could see a state saying, look, we don't think that English, you know, it's not even clear what it would mean, right? That English is the best language, 
right? We just think that everyone should speak English because most people already speak English and, um, you know, if everyone speaks the same language, then we, we gain in efficiency, right? Um, there's actually not much reason why you would do that instead of saying, look, everyone should speak Esperanto, except for the fact that you would probably, f for again, the same efficiency reasons, want to pick whatever language most of your people already spoke so that you're not forcing people to learn, forcing more people than you need to to learn additional languages. Um, so language is sort of the easiest example you can imagine being adopted for instrumental reasons. But you could even, as Kim Luka points out, imagine um, a religion being adopted for instrumental reasons. There have been a number of political thinkers who have thought this, that have said, look, even if you don't say Christianity is true, right, the state doesn't say Christianity is true, you might adopt a common religion for purposes of bringing the populace together, right? Um, you know, you, then if, you, if everyone had to participate in Christian rituals, then everyone would have certain commonalities, uh, they would inculcate, the religion would inculcate in them certain common moral views, uh, or at least attempt to, um, you know, they would have similar, they would, they would all know similar literature, right? We could all, we could all make references to the Bible and everybody would know what we we're talking about. Um, all sorts of intangibles might, that are helpful to keeping your state running properly might flow from having a common religion. And so you can imagine a state for very re for reasons very similar to common language saying, well, we're also going to have a common religion. We don't take any position as a state about whether Christianity is true or not. Right? And the state might still even preserve freedom of conscience to a large extent. Right? The state could even say, I mean, you, you can sort of see Britain as kind of like this. Britain's state religion has become extremely attenuated. Right? But you could you can imagine something that that is you know, somewhere between Britain and Iran, um, where there's a common religion, uh, everybody has to participate in, it's perfectly fine to debate the religion, or to say, you know, well, I'm not quite so sure that the religion is true, the government won't force you to say that Christianity is true, or whatever religion is true, um, but you, know, you have to go to church on Sundays, uh, and your kids have to go to school and be taught about the religion, um, whatever you do at home and that this might arguably uh, benefit the nation in some way without the without any judgment that it's that it's the real truth um, so all of this just goes to this idea uh, this is the distinction Kim Luka makes between the state being neutral which neutrality is compatible with instrumental promotion of one culture over another versus benign neglect which is the much stronger kind of separation of state and culture view that is more common among traditional liberal theorists. Um, but, you know, what Kim Luka is saying to the traditional liberal theorists, what liberal nationalists say, uh, Rorty is another good example, what the liberal nationalists say to the traditional liberal theorists is they say, look, you might need some kind of cultural support to keep your state stable, to keep everybody feeling like they're part of the same project uh, for some kinds of efficiency, like language, uh, to get people to be willing to sacrifice, not just for the state, but even just for other people in the state, right? There's all sorts of evidence that um, perceived cultural and ethnic homogeneity tends to go along with support for welfare, welfarist redistribution. You know, and basically the bottom line is if I, if I see other people in my society as being people like me, being part of my us as opposed to my them, that I'm more likely to be willing to sacrifice my own good for them in various ways. And this might be important to keeping your state running, um, even if it's not kind of built into the moral structure of the universe. So you get a typical liberal nationalist package. This is basically the one Kim Luka endorses, the one a lot of people endorse, where you say, all right, well, we should have a, a common language. Um, we should have some kind of common histor history slash mythology, uh, you know, some kind of common kind of political history where we understand the origin story of our country. We know the national heroes. You know, we have a particular narrative that makes sense of where we are today and why we're all together. Um, that that sort of thing, you know, the kind of thing that that people learn in elementary school. You know learned about the founding fathers and this sort of thing, right? So you, in America, this might mean we teach everybody about the founding fathers and why they were great. Um, we have some kinds of secular rituals, so uh, national holidays, national festivals, um, 
that everybody participates in, regardless of what other subgroup they might belong to. This is the, you know, everybody barbecues on the 4th of July, whether you're Hindu or Muslim or Christian or black or white or whatever, you know, we all come together as Americans and we eat hot dogs on the 4th of July. Um, and some kind of civic creed. So some set, most liberal nationalists actually don't favor having a official religion. But many of them, even many who who are atheists by theological persuasion, have suggested having some kind of set of civic values. Um, John Dewey, who, who I'm pretty sure was an atheist, um, he's a little bit ambiguous, right? But John Dewey talks about a, a, a civic religion, um, even, where this is a common set of values that everybody is encouraged to believe in and that are promoted by the government. Um, so it wouldn't be a religion, but it would be like that part of the, it would be like that part of the religion, right? So it would be something like, you know, there are problems in the U.S. about putting up the Ten Commandments in public places because they are religious uh, or have a religious origin. But lots of people would argue that the rules there, stripped of the idea that they come from God. Um, or at least bracketing the idea that they come from God, the rules in the Ten Commandments are good ones to promote in the society, along with possibly other things like tolerance or courage or, you know, responsibility or whatever. This is the civic creed. Um, and that this can be promoted even to people who may not agree with it. But a lot of people, communitarians especially, think that liberalism is essentially just a naive theory. Uh, it, it gets wrong how human life works. And the big part of the, 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 the core of the problem is really that communitarians and other, and other non-liberals say that the, the core problem is that liberalism makes individualism the core of politi political morality. Liberals, of course, can recognize that things like states or religions or ethnic groups can be important but they're important solely because of the way that they're important to individuals. Um, you know, if every if if all Americans cease to be well served by the existence of the United States, liberals would pretty much have to say, "Well, the United States should go away then." Um, and in particular, one way this individualism manifests, at least saith the communitarians, is through the idea that people's values should all be freely chosen. That we'd, we should encourage people to have a critical attitude towards all tradition and that the ideal is the human being who is free to choose her own life and her own values unfettered by arbitrary things like what tradition she was born into. Um, and communitarians think that this is just an impossible picture of how humans operate and that you screw things up if you try to think of human beings this way. Because they'll say, look, individual freedom doesn't mean anything <clears throat> outside of a social context. So look at the kinds of things that you would like to exercise your freedom to do, right? Um, you know, communitarians will say, you know, I look at myself, right? You say, well, um, I would like to use my freedom to be a philosophy professor. I would like to use my freedom to be a father. I would like to use my freedom to be, um, you know, to be engaged in certain kinds of social activism. I would like to use my freedom to engage in certain kinds of certain kinds of hobbies, right? I, I like using some of my freedom to, uh, you know, play geeky role-playing games from my youth and go to the gym, right? All of these sorts of things. These are the kinds of things people choose, right? You might choose to use your free. You choose to use your freedom to come and be a student at a school of public policy, right? Um, I'm sure I read your application dossiers for many of you. You might choose to use. You, you know, you have all sorts of things you want to do with your lives, and you want to be free to do. You want to work for government agencies. You want to change the world. You want to, you know, make a lot of money. Um, humanitarians will say, stop for a minute and think about all of these things we want to be free to do and almost none of them are things that you could do as an isolated individual 
more or less all of them require some connection to other human beings, not even t just for instrumental possibility, but even to make sense. Right? So take even something that's, that's in part biological, like fatherhood or motherhood, right? You'll see very commonly, especially in discussions of things like fostering and adoption, people saying that, you know, being, uh, you know, anyone can be the biological parent of a child, right? But being a father requires a certain kind of social standing and social relationships, right? I can't be a father in the way that fathering is understood in 21st century America in 15th century Britain, right? It just is a role that's not available, right? Look at the way that notions of motherhood have changed over time. Some things are available but no longer the dominant model, and some things are simply not available. And especially a communitarian would say, let's look at some of the things that you can't do because of your cultural context, not because you're done enough money or whatever, right? I, I literally cannot become a samurai. It just, I can't. Uh, even if I had unlimited money, um, I would, yeah, and uh, even if I had unlimited money in a time machine, right? I can't become a samurai, right? I'm not the right ethnicity to be a samurai. You know, I'm not the right bloodline to be a samurai. And there just, and there just are no samurai, right? Like I could go and buy myself samurai armor and a katana, but all it would be is a nerd in samurai armor and a katana, right? There's, there's, there's nothing I could do to be a samurai. And the communitarian says, look, if you think that that's a problem, you're missing the point, right? If we had a world, you, you couldn't have a world where I could just as easily become a samurai as a philosophy professor. Because again, both of them are culturally bound. If I say I want to escape my culture, where am I escaping it to? I would escape it to nowhere. I couldn't escape from a world where I can become a where I can be a philosophy professor, but I can't ever become a samurai, to a world where I could become both. Right? I'm just going to escape to a world where I can't be either because there's not the social context for them. So the the the, the deep part of the communitarian critique is is to say the concept of freedom that we have is fundamentally non-individualistic. The exercise of freedom only makes sense within a context of other people and traditions and concepts, most of which we have not freely chosen. The, the very possibility I have of being a philosophy professor and a father relies on a background social context that I did not choose. And I wouldn't be able to choose anything, you know, somewhat paradoxically, but hopefully I've at least motivated why you might believe this. Um, somewhat paradoxically, I would not be able to choose anything meaningful unless there were some unchosen things in my life. In fact, quite a few unchosen things about my life. All right, so how does this scale up to the state? Well, the communitarians are going to say, therefore, if states want to protect freedom, they can't just protect individual choice. Um, they have to protect and promote social concepts of the good. If all they do is protect individual choice, this leads to dissolution of the context that makes personal freedom meaningful in. If they just say, well, look, anyone can do whatever they want, then all of these structures that support our meaningful freedom break down. Meaningful choice disappears, we become atomized, and we're left with, with deeply unsatisfying lives. Right? A lot of communitarians will say, actually, it's not just that, <clears throat> it's not so much that you break down into this place where you don't have any meaningful choice left, it's that you always have some kind of social and cultural context. And so if the state doesn't promote a good one, what will happen is someone else will promote a bad one. Right? So some communitarians will take this in a different direction and say, it's not as if in contemporary liberal society what we see is a breakdown of tradition that renders our individual choices meaningless. Um, it's that we see the eclipse of more traditional societies in favor of not nothing, but in favor of a particular society, a kind of consumerist, 
isolated, um, disconnected society. And our choices are now in the context of that one, and guess what? That one only leaves us really crummy choices, or at least less satisfying choices. All right. And then the other part of this is that the notion of justice, a lot of communitarians will say, is tied in with the notion of the community. Miller uh, nods to Walzer in this direction. You know, talking about, when we talk about justice, when we talk about giving people what they need and deserve, what kinds of claims um, are meaningful may be relative to the structure of the community. So the kind of Rawlsian project of finding primary goods, right? Um, communitarians will say this Rawlsian project of finding primary goods is misguided. There are no things that are good for everyone's conception of life in all possible communities. But if you have a community, then you can say, okay, in our community, what people need to live a good life, even to live any one of the possible good lives allowed by our community, right? Communities can still allow multiple good lives. Um, we could say, in our community, in order to live um, some kind of good life that is valid within our community, you need money. Or in a different community, they might say, well, anyone to live any of the lives that, that are valued in our community, um, you need um, religious faith or something. So there are no primary goods that are, that are universal. There would only be community-bound primary goods or community-bound goods that are distributed in accord with justice. So not just to feel the force of the way that some liberals are concerned, right, that I won't help people out who, aren't, who I don't feel are like me, but even to make sense of what it is that I owe people may be communally bound. Pardon. So this leads people into a different kind of notion, which is a communitarian kind of nationalism. Um, for the liberal, for the typical liberal, nation states, their primary raison d'etre, their primary reason for being is to um, keep people safe from violence, basically. I mean, this is the Hobbesian picture, especially, and even the Lockean picture. The idea is that we come together for various reasons, but when we come together, we enter into conflict. The state is there to tamp down, mitigate, channel, and resolve conflict. Communitarians, and a lot of them will claim this is a, sort of an older notion, communitarians say, no, no, no. The primary purpose of the state is to promote justice. That's what the state is there for. The state is to allow you to live a good life in a way that you would not be able to live without a political community backed up by a state. Um, there are communitarians, of course, who are not communitarian nationalists because they don't believe states let you do this. But let's focus on the communitarians who identify the community with the state, or at least believe that the state is a necessary support for the community. Um, and, you know, justice requires a moral community. So you, you, get the, you have the state to promote justice and you have a moral community um, that is required for justice. So the state has to promote the creation of this kind of moral community. Um, now, what makes them nationalists, you could also be a sort of communitarian cosmopolitan if you wanted to, but what makes them nationalists is that <clears throat> communitarians typically believe that there is no moral community between states, or at least communitarian nationalists believe this. There, it, it makes sense to talk about the moral community of Americans, it makes sense to talk about the moral community of the French, about the moral community of the Bangladeshis. It doesn't make sense to talk about a global moral community. I don't share a moral culture with Bangladeshis. There might be things we agree on, but there's a really intuitive sense in which I'm not part of Bangladeshi culture, and trying to create a kind of global monoculture would, would be a cure worse than the disease. Communitarians also think that in order to get states doing their job well enough, um, a commitment to abstract justice, for the reasons just mentioned, is not enough, um, and a commitment to sort of bare national identity is not enough. Just believing that I'm an American and in the American creed, right, believing that the founding fathers were great. Most communitarians are going to say that the kind of thing that, that liberals want, for liberal, nation, liberal nationalists want, is just not going to be enough to support the kind of moral community that justice requires. The fact that I and uh, a, a, Tex, you know, a Texan and an Alaskan and a Montanan, Montanan, right, you know, might all agree that Abraham Lincoln was pretty keen Right? That's not going to be enough to generate the kind of moral community um, that's needed. Um, as a result, some kind of inherent moral weight needs to be given to the community. Um, and this might have 
at least two aspects. One is that because there's an inherent moral weight to the community itself, there might be reasons I have to preserve the community that go beyond how it helps individual people in the community, right? So you get into things like um, the apparently paradoxical nature uh, of dying for your country, right? Communitarian nationalists don't have as much of a problem with that because they could say, look, the nation is more important than you. It might also take precedence uh, over individuals outside. Now, communitarians are typically not going to say that you have no obligations to anybody else, right? So communitarians are not going to say if you're walking by and you see a drowning child, uh, you get to say, oh, well, you know, that's a French child. I'm not going to save it, right? I have made a promise to, 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 to have coffee with an American, and Americans, you know, are better than French for me, and so I don't save the French child. No, they're typically, communitarians are typically going to say that you have certain kinds of minimal bare obligations to everybody just in virtue of their humanity perhaps um, but most of our real detailed obligations are going to be to members of the community because it, it because it is the w moral weight of the community that makes the difference right so they may very well say look you shouldn't just go randomly kill or steal from people outside of your national community but only within your national community are you obligated to try to eat, distribute goods on an egalitarian basis, right? If you see someone starving who's French, maybe you should help them out. But you don't need to like have a welfare redistribution with the French. Um, that, it, it, for that sort of thing, it is the weight of the national community that makes the difference. Okay, so if you buy any of these reasons for placing a value on building and maintaining and privileging a national community, as a policy matter and a moral matter, you're ultimately going to run up against the issue of nation building. So um, in some classes, in some discussions, uh, especially in, in now in this age of Iraq and Afghanistan for the US, you will see people talking about um, nation building first. And you'll see a lot of other folks saying, no, 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 we can't, you can't do nation building. We're doing a state building. Um, so here we are, we are explicitly not talking about state building. So when people in the literature on this sort of, on uh, things like um, reconstruction, uh, you know, when, when George Bush said, you know, said that, you know, we don't do nation building, you know, right before he, we did a whole lot of nation building. Um, usually what they're doing is they're using nation building as a kind of imprecise way of talking about state building, right? A lot of what we're trying to do in Iraq and Afghanistan, or you know, ostensibly trying to do in Iraq and Afghanistan, are things like get a working police force, get a working government, get a working tax collection system, get the get the water running and the electricity running, and and you know, build the roads and that sort of thing. That's state building. That's building the institutions and infrastructure that you need for a modern state. But if you believe in the importance of nationalism, you're going to have to confront the need for nation building, which is actually building a kind of culture or identity. You'll hear some people say this is impossible. That doesn't stop almost every state from trying to do it and probably needing to do it if it's going to be stable over the long term on the communitarian nationalist view, or even actually the liberal nationalist view, any kind of nationalist view that thinks that there's a reason why you want to have a national identity has to do with the fact that national identities don't come from nowhere and they don't sustain themselves. They especially don't sustain themselves in the face of a lot of things that we deal with now, like large scale immigration or even small scale immigration, um, clashes of economic interests, Right, it's a pretty powerful thing to, you know, with all with all the talk of the 99% and the 1% that's been going on in the U.S. in in the last little while. Right, it's a pretty powerful thing to convince a random, you know, unemployed manufacturing worker that her interests are bound up with the interests of Warren Buffett, right? Um, that's a pretty big deal. Like, they, they seem to be on opposite sides of a lot of issues. So, 
if you have those kinds of pressures, economic inequality, uh, ethnic differences, religious differences, uh, cultural differences from other sorts of things, you're going to need to do a lot of work to sustain a national identity, even if you, even if you started with one. And the usual way, uh, in terms of policy, that this is done is through inculcating some kind of common culture. Uh, typical things. You, you have an official language. Uh, the state, to some extent, controls education and or the media. Um, so this doesn't have to be as totalitarian as it might initially sound. But right, you know, when you go to public school in the United States, you say the Pledge of Allegiance. Do you still? When I was in public school, you, you said the Pledge of Allegiance, right? You could opt out. Um, but by default, you say the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, you learn about American history, and you tend to learn about American history in a fairly positive light. You know, there's all sorts of arguments about it, but, um, you know, the state, in the form of school boards and whatnot, you know, look at history te textbooks and discuss, you know, whether or not the founding fathers are being portrayed in a positive enough, a positive enough light. Um, here in the U.S., the government doesn't exercise a lot of real direct control over the media, um, but they influence the media in all sorts of subtle ways. Um, even if we're not talking about things like where they, they embargo a story, you know, the government is very savvy about press releases. Um, the government holds press conferences and gets its version of the story out to the media, and a lot of the media, you know, report the government's version of things. You know, the government is very, very interested in controlling its perception in the media that um, that individual Americans consume. Um, you might also have different kinds of civic festivals and obligations. We're going to talk more about obligations when we talk about citizenship theory. Uh, this might be the softer side, right? You know, every TV show has a special Christmas episode, right? They don't all have special Hanukkah or Diwali episodes. They all have special Christmas episodes because in America, Christmas has become a kind of, you know, even though it has religious roots, it's also become a kind of secular festival for a large number of Americans. Um, you know, we celebrate the 4th of July, right? Fourth of July stuff all over the place. Um, you know, you have, we have other kinds of President's Day, Martin Luther King Day, right? We have all of these um, these more minor holidays that celebrate kind of the canon of American heroes. You know, so all that sort of stuff is a way of um, inculcating a common culture of trying to not create a state, but trying to create an American identity uh, that people will all participate in, and that will give some sort of fat structure to the to, to the nation state. Um, now, all of that sound might sound relatively benign. Some people probably doesn't sound benign at all, but it might sound relatively benign. But there are also, you know, more problematic sides of nation building. Um, if you accept nationalism um, as a moral theory <coughs> or as an element of your political morality, not only are you saying straightforwardly, um, there are going to be times when uh, we privilege our co-nationals over other people, um, and in a way that, that makes cosmopolitans blanch with horror. But you're also saying that, um, you're also typically saying that it is going to be legitimate for the state to use its powers to try to shape the national culture in various ways, um, both using carrots and sometimes sticks. Right, so it may involve um, nation building. May involve assimilating immigrants. Uh, you know, requiring that Im immigrants learn English, requiring that they learn certain things about American history. Uh, you know, this was a huge argument when I lived in Quebec, where if you if you were an immigrant and moved to Quebec, your children have to go to French school. A lot of immigrants to to Quebec um, wanted their kids to learn English because English is still the lingua for I mean, almost everyone in Quebec speaks English. Um, and then if you want to go, it's still the language of business. If you want to go to the U.S., you want to go elsewhere in Canada, it's still the dominant language. But the Quebecois government said, no, to promote our subnational culture, if you come to Quebec, you learn French. You can also learn English if you want, but you have to learn French. That's You have to go to the French elementary schools and learn French there. Um, so you know, may involve assimilating immigrants in, in, in various kinds of ways. Uh, it may also in involve excluding or marginalizing some residents. Kimlicka talks a lot about it. Um, 
if you're a small enough group and you eschew participation in politics, if you're the Amish, then you may be able to essentially strike a deal with the state where, okay, you get to opt out of the nation building project, right? Um, Amish are not a large organized political bloc. They're not a large number of Americans. And so um, we give them various kinds of protections and say, essentially, you can, you don't want to be part of our nation building project. You're small enough and weak enough that that's fine. We're just going to leave you out for the most part. Um, but it may involve harsher kinds of marginalization. Um, you know, Kimlicka talks about the fact that there are temporary worker programs in lots of countries and you know, people talk about it for the US. And um, so, you know, the idea would be if we had the idea behind these things is that you would allow people in, but not as proper immigrants, um, but as people who have to leave at some point and don't have full legal protections. So, you know, the deal, quote unquote, deal with them would essentially be, OK, fine. You don't have to integrate into American culture, but the only reason we accept you not integrating is that you can't stay. Um, and this is often driven by a feeling or a belief rather that allowing certain groups in, especially to the extent that they resist assimilation or are perceived to resist assimilation would weaken or destroy the national culture, right? So this is behind a lot of xenophobia in Europe, for instance. Right? Europe doesn't have even the tradition, the sort of ambivalent tradition of being a nation of immigrants, most European nations uh, uh, that the U.S. does. You know, many Europeans seem a lot more comfortable just saying, look, we, do, we don't want African immigrants coming here because we don't want them to be, we don't want to change our understanding of our culture in a way that would allow them to be part of it. Uh, and we certainly don't want them to be sort of non-assimilated here in large numbers. And the other side of it is that it does involve systematically privileging at least some elements of the dominant culture. Making English the official language favors English speakers. It just does, right? Um, having Christmas function as a kind of partly secular holiday in the U.S. to some extent, you know, largely in subtle ways, um, favors Christians, right? Um, the, they're going to be more comfortable with the iconography and the knowledge and the place in the world of, of, of Christmas than people who are non-Christians to a large extent. Now, again, communitarians especially are just going to say, well, that's, that's fine, right? There's nothing wrong with favoring one group over another. And in fact, you have to do it, right? You can't have a system where there's literally, you know, we literally have no standards for what's better or worse. And all the standards for better or worse are culturally bound. So live with it. All right. Well, nonetheless, there are some concerns about this. First is, there's been some pushback from liberals to say, look, the radical individualism that the communitarians especially want to saddle liberals with is just not something liberals are actually committed to. Uh, liberals will say, look, for, first of all, we're methodologically individualist. We believe that ultimately the true value of everything comes down to the individual, but we recognize that for individuals, the groups that they're part of is often a big part of what's important to them. There's nothing in liberalism that says we can't recognize that. Yeah, sure. We are dedicated to the view that um, if a group identity became no longer good for the members of the group, there's nothing special about the group identity. But they'll say, until that point, we're perfectly happy to have policies that um, help people foster whatever their chosen group identities are. And beyond that point, then, then there's just something bizarre a lot of liberals would say about, you know, wanting to preserve the identity for the sake of the identity, not for the people who have that identity. Um, and a lot, there are a number of liberals in Nussbaum among them who will say, well, we actually need, they'll actually, they'll often take on part of the communitarian critique and say, you know, communitarians are right. There needs to be a identity for people to buy into. But people like Nussbaum will say, there can perfectly well be a liberal cosmopolitan identity. Uh, there's nothing saying that your identity needs to be as parochial as a lot of human identities have been in the past. Um, sure, it used to be their identity was tied up with our tribe or family or clan, whatever, 
now our nation state, but why shouldn't we create an identity that's tied up with our humanity, that's tied up with our, uni- our, our, our universal position in the world? As we mentioned, um, especially communitarian projects raise some serious questions about what do we do with minority groups? Um, if we're saying we're going to have this national culture, uh, there's really two questions. How much can we force my minority groups to go along with, with, with the plan? Right, um, and in the U.S., especially with religion, you see all sorts of debates about this. Um, the other issue is, if we ratify, if we validate a kind of cultural identity, uh, a kind of place for cultural identity in our moral structure, does this undercut? our obligations to minority groups within the culture. Um, You know, are we essentially saying that it's okay if I don't want to help people who are not part, who maybe happen to be part of my state, but are not part of my national cultural group, right? Um, this, This kind of problem essentially is what leads Miller to say, what we really need to do is try to make the boundaries of states and the boundaries of nations line up as nicely as possible, because there are moral issues with saying that, you know, for instance, I need to extend my egalitarian redistribution of goods to everyone in the state, as opposed to everyone who I see as part of my national cultural identity. Similar kinds of concerns arise about marginalized and dissidents. Um, In general, one of the big concerns about communitarianism is what about the dissident within the community? Uh, a lot of people will will accuse communitarians of reifying the community, right? Of saying, "This is what Americans believe," or "This is what Christians believe," or "This is what you know, whatever believe," and not recognize the internal diversity in that group. And in particular, in terms of politics, communitarianism has been used as a pretext for. Sc- for getting power to squash internal dissent, um, you know there are there are groups that have essentially argued, you know, we want to have the right to educate our children in our own um, our own way, in part to stop them from, you know, we don't want them to learn things about the outside culture or get ideas from the outside culture. Uh, you know, you see this. I mean, education of children is actually probably the biggest place where this comes up in the U.S., right? So, um, think about arguments about teaching about homosexuality in schools, right? There are a lot of people in the U.S. who say part of our understanding of our culture, our commu- our moral community, is that homosexuality is evil, and we don't want someone else coming in and telling our children oh, homosexuality is just sort of one option among many for your, you know, for your sexual practice. So, communitarian style argument is often used to support a kind of communal freedom, freedom for a religious community or an ethnic community or a national community that part of what the community wants is the freedom to quash dissent and difference within its own bounds. Um, and this is a deep problem for liberals who might be attracted to the kind of communi- to some aspects of the communitarian uh, argument, like Kimilka is. Um, we already mentioned Miller's things about uh, states that aren't nation states, this lines up with the other things. And then there is this issue about basic human rights. Um, the Many nationalists, as I mentioned before, will have a place for some basic human rights, some things we owe people just because they're other people. But um, many nationalists and many communitarians will say that that's a pretty limited set. So a lot of nationalists, um, like Miller, like Rawls, as it turns out, will say that we have certain kinds of negative duties to people outside of our national community. But that's it. right? We can't kill them, we can't steal, steal from them, we sort of can't violate their rights to life and property. But if they're starving, 
we have no moral obligation to feed them. It might be nice, but we have no obligation to feed them. Um, if they suffer from a national disaster, yeah, as a natural disaster, we have no obligation to help them. We certainly have no obligation to do things like redistribute wealth on the global, the global scale. We probably don't have an obligation to do things like make sure that the rules of the global system are fair um, in any way that goes beyond not killing or stealing from them, right? So if the U.S. wants to massively subsidize its farmers in a way that is harmful to farmers in poorer parts of the world, um, many uh, communitarians and nationalists will say, there's nothing wrong with that. The U.S. can do whatever it wants for its own farmers um, because we don't have those kinds of obligations of fairness across national boundaries because of the lack of communal connection. And for a lot of people, they don't feel that like that's enough, that, that this picture of robust rights and obligations within national communities and very, very minimal rights and obligations across national boundaries um, makes moral sense. Even people who maybe not all the way to true cosmopolitan universalism. So, we're going to talk more about human rights next week, though, or after break. So, to sum up, basic problem. Many moral theories, most of the ones we've looked at, seem to imply universalism and cosmopolitanism. They look universalist on their face. Uh, and this runs up against the very common intuition people have that <clears throat> we have special obligations to those close to us and quite possibly to our nations. There are liberal nationalists who try to resolve this by seeing an instrumental role for national culture and for um, privileging your connection with, with your co-nationals. There are communitarian nationalists who think it's more fundamental that the uh, morality is simply not universal. Morality is deeply tied to your culture and your particular situation and the kind of freedom and universalism that liberals aspire to doesn't make sense outside of a context of tradition. And probably the sharpest problem for a policy person is that if you have a nation, you need nation building. And this is where the fears of the liberals really come out, which is that once you say it's okay to have a nation, it looks like it's okay to force people um, you know, not with a gun to their head necessarily, but maybe on pain of expulsion, maybe on pain of marginalization, maybe on pain of not being able to fully participate, to force people to participate in a kind of national culture that they may not um, accept in full. And as a policy matter, there may be a difficult process of negotiating where the boundaries are how much people should be required to participate in the national culture, to what extent subnational cultures, minority cultures should be allowed to flourish, and on, on what kinds of kinds of topics. I look forward to talking about that with you guys.